All right, coming to you from Grogu Studios. This is the Musician's Insider. My name's Cronus, and I have a very special guest today, Rachel Ann Mullins. Yay! Yay, and, I am a special guest, that's correct. And Rachel um, is a host of a podcast, and she's also an actress and producer, and she's a Hollywood insider. So I figured, why not bring her on the Musician's Insider? Because music and Hollywood is all intertwined, and if not deeper than you even ever know. How are you today, Rachel? I am. It's it's. I'm in India, so it's like the start of the monsoon season, which is why my hair is so ratchet because it is raining to beat the band outside. So, well, good morning. It's bright and early. It's 10 a.m. for me. What time is it for you? It's like the opposite for me. So it's like eight o'clock at night. Well, thanks for um, being on the podcast with me today. You want to tell me a little bit about what you've been up to for the fa- past few years? We haven't connected in a while, and uh, tell me what about your latest. Uh, why you're in india (laughs) my latest and greatest um okay so here's the crazy part at the height of corona time the height of corona hysteria in hollywood everything's shut down everybody's wringing their hands can't even hike runyon canyon um and i was like you know what let me just throw all my stuff in a storage unit and take my dog and we're gonna go to bollywood because i've had an agent here since like 2016 2017 and he's I've him and I've always talked about me working here but he's needed me to be in country for a while for that to work out and I wanted back then I wanted to do it like a per project basis like get me get me attached to a project and then I'll come to India and then we'll do it and then I'll go back well as it happens because the borders were closed and, and they still are a year later um I have a special business visa here so they the only white people they let in this year is Rachel Mullen so I got to come and be basically the the only white actress from Hollywood going um so I got really like the literally I landed really late one night on September 2nd and the next day I had an audition for Volkswagen like just quick quickity quickity quick um and then since then I've got to do this really cool web series called Shutzba that's coming out next month in June and then I have another big 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 Bollywood movie coming out in December um with like huge huge Bollywood actors like sort of like the Indian version of Tom Cruise and it would it would like being in Mission Impossible basically like with the Bali version it's amazing my agent here is so fantastic he's adorable his name's Ravi he's always got dollar signs in his eyes and he's like if we can do this and you can direct a project and blah 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 blah." like he's just so exuberant I wish I had 10 of them in like every market I would be so happy you sound excited well that's fun do you get to do stunts uh no which is good because I don't stunt actually that's what I figured (laughs) I don't stunt, I don't stunt so much that I don't even like watching other people do stunts. Like fair enough. This is this is such a silly example, but um Dave Franco in the magician movie, the now you see me when they're doing all the car stunts, I'm like, well, Dave's too small for that. Like I can't, like I can't even watch it. If I read if somebody sends me a script and got stunts in it, like no, no, I won't I'm not producing it, I'm not directing it, I'm not. I'm not doing anything on it. <laughs> okay, well, on a on a insider perspective, if someone sends you a script, why? Who would send you a script? And and if there's people out there with scripts, are you accepting scripts? And or do you have any advice for people that are trying to do things? Well, I do get unsolicited scripts, um, and then I do have people that I kind of know, like in my peripheral that I don't like know personally, but I know of around this, you know, the ethos of screenwriting that asked me for coverage and I stopped doing coverage a few years ago um, because it got to be too much. And I felt like people felt like they were entitled to it, which is a bad, is a bad, bad, bad thing to do. Like getting somebody to read your script is like a really, it's a really big deal. And it's not something that you should just take for granted. Um, Even if you're asking for a note to pass or you're asking for, you know, to tap, to attach an actor or a crew position like a DP or literally anybody, um, getting somebody to read your script like a big deal. So I kind of 
worked out like a, a system for it and that I don't like reading digital scripts. I like them to be printed and bound like old school. So it, it filters out the people wild. that don't do that. Do it, exactly. So I would be like, okay, send a copy over to the Kinkos and Toluca, Toluca Lake across from the Chipotle that I'm going to be at anyway, five days a week. And then, <laughs> and then I will go through, if it was like in a pre-approved person, I will go through and I will mark out your script and I will do like a, not a full breakdown, but like a 75% breakdown, like from a producer standpoint of like the situation. But and again, that's it. How does it work with showrunners? Like, I don't do movies so much, so I'm not in that world. But um, like, do you have to have a showrunner? What is a showrunner? <laughs> okay, a showrunner. Oh, That's more for TV shows. Yeah, well, I mean, but it's a it's a major major deal. Like, to be a showrunner is a super 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 hard job, and it's not just something that happens. It is a definitely like a career trajectory. And I think with I mean, I think that's about a lot of positions in entertainment, but this one in particularly, like you can't teach somebody how to be a showrunner. Like you can learn from mentors and like be in a lot of writer's rooms and like eventually move your way up. But a showrunner is basically like the head writer of the entire show. And they're running the entire writing writer's room and like the entire department and they're guiding the ship. Um, a lot of times showrunners also direct or they're um sometimes they're EPs or sometimes they're producers it depends on what they're trying to do with the award show award situation um are they involved in the funding sometimes I mean well I mean for television funding like you're trying to get picked up by a network but kind of like if you have a really like say you are a screenwriter and you have a lit agent and you have a pop-in pilot script that is, it's, it's got juice. And if you attach a showrunner, that's a showrunner with some, with also some juice, you know, that's how you get to make cocktails most of the time. Um, so being able to attach a showrunner is a really, really, really big deal, but they have to be a, a good one, you know? Gotcha. Anything exciting coming up with you? Like, I mean, obviously. Uh, like, well, I mean, work-wise, like, I just, I actually just watched an e-commerce store the other day, bougiesaurusfresh.com. Um, and it sort of was born because there's, like, this running, like, running joke, like, if you work for me, like, I'm a little bit bougie and a little bit ratchet and roll. Oh, wait, repeat that. I think it cut out a little. Yeah, somebody called me. Um, so, anyway, it was born because there's like this running joke in production and that like if you work with me I'm a little bit bougie and a little bit ratchet and roll like I'm both so <laughs> I love it so Detroit <laughs> Is it? well because it's true like it's ghetto but we get the job done um so that's kind of how it was born and it's like tie-dye jumpsuits and harem pants and hoodies that say thou shall not try me 24 7 which is which is actually accurate. And there's going to be more stuff too coming down the pipeline, but that's the stuff that's on there for now. And you've um, partnered with one of your friends? Oh, uh, kind of. So like as an influencer, like you always get these unsolicited or sometimes solicited pitches from these brands and like, oh, can you like influence and like post about my company? And like a lot of times it is brands that could not be less aligned with who you are or who your following is. Like, if I had a dollar for every single time a coffee company pitched me, I don't drink coffee. I don't even know how to make it. I can, I was at least ruined three different coffee machines on three different sets because I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, That's hilarious. So I went to my friends that are influencers and I strategically bought things that their followers connect with. So it's usually the, uh, I kind of went backwards on it. It's usually a brand's like, we're going to be like this and this is our vision and this is our whatever. And then they just mass pitch influencers to post about their stuff, whether or not it aligns or not. And then they, uh, most of the time, you know this, because I learned SEO from you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you for getting a Twitter account. I wanted to say that because remember you didn't want one. <laughs> 
I didn't want any of them. And you still have all of the passwords to everything because it's never changed. Um, for better or for worse. I keep um, things safe but, for you. <laughs> but at the end, like at the end of like these campaigns, the brands are like, we didn't make any money and that person didn't sell and they didn't convert. And it's like, well, the thing that you have and the thing that their followers resonate with Targeting. are two different they're two different things and that's not necessarily going to translate the conversion for you so um yeah so i kind of deconstructed that so our i do the buying based on my friends that i'm working with based on their following and what they're into very cool so as a musician what i do uh to try to get influence things happening is we go to like the nam show and like i'm wearing these in NAM is awesome. i, went I a got couple. these yeah from 64 audio and i'm promoting them because i am one of their artists now and i get it for They're artist pricing good. and these are the best 12 driver ones you can get i got a new guitar over there i got a lot of cool things that i get from influence but when people approach my instagram and say hey we love what you're doing we want to you know it's always here's a code to get a percentage off our stuff. So they're not even approaching me. They're just trying to spam me to buy stuff. I can't even get to that level. Oh, totally. I mean, there's, I mean, that's, that's a dime a dozen. There's so many of those and I don't know how they survive with that business model, but I, I maybe they do. Couldn't there's so you. many want to want to be influencers out there that just cling to this stuff, I guess. But, um, the, ain't it the truth though? Ain't it the truth? I don't know. It's so weird because like, I feel like, I feel like I was doing stuff like long before the term in influencer was coined and back when people were saying like face maker or like promoter and like none of those things really well, truly did the thing well i'm gonna be honest with you like i i when i saw your no filter friday podcast it kind of just reminded me of hanging out and talking to you like <laughs> That's and what i was like people say and I haven't seen you in a long time. And I was like, oh, what's she up to? And now I'm like, I feel like I've caught up now without having to even, this is the <laughs> first time. We, I don't think I've seen you since that James Cameron party. Probably not. Probably oh not. my, and like, and I thought it'd be funny to talk about some stuff like that. Like, that's funny. That was a funny night, <laughs> right? Like, it was a funny night. It was, wow. It's so, it's so crazy to watch one of the most waste, like guys that's like, one of them runs the most wasteful sets in the history of Hollywood get up and talk about environmentalism like for 40 minutes like oh. bro and people were people were talking over him yes yes it was it was the mess it was <laughs> it was a good party but it was James Cameron talking but he knew and, it was a mess and I brought a lot of my friends like I even brought my friend Bob he's a screenwriter I want to connect you to him actually he was there. I brought Zhenya. I brought my other friend. Um, uh, she and I performed at the Viper Room uh, for my album a couple of years back. I also brought just several friends that I knew that would go to these things. And I remember bringing you and one of your friends who I'd met and I didn't realize she was there. That was really funny because I'd met her in Park City, Heather. <laughs> yeah, too, oh. we, 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 we had a ton of people there that night. Um, I, still have, I have like red carpet pictures, like Joanna Krupa. And then at the Paris Hilton night, was ran, with you guys. Paris Hilton was was DJing, and I ran into her. Her manager, Jamie Freed, has been a friend of mine for a long time. Um, and then at the end, like Taylor Armstrong came popping out of nowhere, and she's like giving hugs, me like I love you. Like it was, you know, it was a, it was an evening. And I didn't know your friend that I knew had gotten the ticket through you because I had given you the ticket. And she told me, no, I got you two extra tickets through my buddy, Mike, because they were supposed to be like $2,000 tickets, but they were giving them away for 40 bucks before the night was over to people. It was kind of how weird how they did that. And it was kind of a sketchy party. Because like, maybe, I don't know, because I like, I know we had a publicist walk us on the carpet. Like, I feel like that's back when Pad was handling carpet for us. Well, I, I remember what was that night. What was really funny was uh, our mutual friend had told me that she got tickets from you. And I remember you'd asked me for two, two extra tickets. So I'm like, oh my God, those are the tickets I gave you. It was so funny. <laughs> it's a circle. But it's a uh, circle. I like how we were able to, you know, share the, like when people have invites to things and try to put people on lists, you try to hook everyone up. Um, I haven't really had any hookups in a while, um, but in Toronto, I got to see you Steel know, Panther. <laughs> 
how did Steel Panther make it to Toronto? Explain to me the logistics, because now this is a physics equation. Okay, well, do you know how uh, I was working with Jay Rustin? He was in our band mm -hmm. back in the day. And then when we, we all kind of came to LA, he's now their producer or whatever. So I said, hey, I'm going to see them in Toronto. It's the same night Metallica was playing too. And we couldn't get the small club Metallica tickets, but I was like, let's get on. It was my buddy's birthday. So we got tickets to Steel Panther, thanks to Jay, and uh, got to do the guest list thing. And they're signed to Universal now. They don't, people don't get naked on stage anymore and it's more cleaned up, but it's definitely oh. worldwide. What? What? That's not Steel Panther. I'm I know. It's, it's not, not Steel Panther. Panther key club is when we really was the, when it was crazy but they're awesome i love those guys and they're they're hilarious really good musicians they're comedy they're comedians comedy let's talk about comedy you're funny have you ever thought of doing comedy um i people ask me that a lot i prefer my comedy in a video based sort of format like produced i really I really like making, I really like taking comedic parts in movies or TV shows. And as far as like making my own stuff, I like, I like doing sort of like, I guess you could call them like short films, like probably longer form. Like a, it would, like if you were to put it in like an improv sort of category, it'd be like a longer form sketch, I guess you could say. Uh, I mean, not like a 90 minute Harold Sketch scene. comedy? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, not necessarily, but like written, written sketch that translates. Like I made, um, me and my friend from Warner Brothers, Jason Schultz, and then Rachel Sterling made this uh, short film for PGA a couple of years ago. That was that year, the, um, like the honoree was Mike Nichols. So we made this sort of like the graduate-esque kind of a thing. And I got to be Mrs. Franklin. Um and it was like that's the so wait i know who mrs robinson is who's mrs franklin yeah so we the the honoree for that year's pga short situation was mike nichols so we could sort of took our own spin on mrs robinson so i was mrs franklin got you i love it i see and i know you're an audrey hepburn fan too i can just every time i see I mean, stuff about her it makes me think of your stuff <laughs> You know, I haven't gotten that in a while and I'm kind of salty about it. It's a little upsetting. <laughs> like, wait a second. Well, but you haven't been acting okay. like her as much. You used to act like her. Like, you know, you expect the powder room stuff and you talk or, or like just look at people. That, that was your that was your thing. And now you're more yeah, chill. I mean, my um I think I've really like after doing a couple projects like I really think I found my like my direction and like the genres that I like and what resonates with me your niche and uh-huh what is yeah, your niche like, I my well I mean that kind of goes back to that bougie ratchet thing there's a couple there's a couple genres that I really really love like I really like stuff that's like single location and just a couple actors like the one I love and match are really great examples of that. Even though the actors are, you know, amazing. It's like the Duplass brothers and, you know, the other one, Patrick Stewart and Carla Giugino. So I really nice. like single location, like just letting that, the dialogue and the, the art of cinematography tell a story. Um, and then I also really like, uh, as far as like directing and producing goes like really dark stuff like super heavy subject material I really resonate with because again I'm from Detroit so I thought you were from Paris different. France I thought you were from Paris <laughs> nobody gets that joke on my Facebook like it hasn't landed ever and it's been up there for well probably like 10 years now what's and the it's joke not, it's not going well. okay so in the devil wears Prada uh the guy that plays the mentalist he's like i'm from wherever but paris is my hometown and okay. that's the joke that's in my facebook and literally no one gets it people are like are you really from no i'm, I'm gonna not. be honest i 
I was afraid to even say you're from Detroit because I thought maybe you weren't telling people that. I'm like, why she got Paris, France there? It's got to mean something funny to do with that. I, I, I wasn't sure if you were afraid to be like you didn't want people to know you were American or if you were trying to say, I, I thought that was hilarious, but I haven't talked to you about it because you didn't have I Facebook. Can't. <laughs> Back in the day. Yeah. No, I, no, I don't think I could hide any of those things. Um, and like the further abroad I go, the more American I I become like when Angela and I went to Cannes, we remember that we didn't even know each other. And she just came bopping down the street and she's like, oh, Rachel, because I look so tragically American in the sea of Europeans. Like, that's got to be the chick. I've never met her, but it's got to be her. That was so funny. Angela Cullens, Rachel Mullins, the Ullens. I wanted to take credit the for Ullens, that series. Collectively. But, uh, <laughs> I never saw you, it. You still might. You never know. You still might. That's cool. I, I actually reconnected with her a little bit online a couple years back. She's out West, but um, she seems to be happy and fun, but I haven't, I don't think she's working in that field anymore. I could be, I could be wrong. Um, she's doing things. Don't quote me. Her and I went to Vegas a couple years ago together. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I know. I haven't seen her since. We went to Vegas completely comped for like a whole weekend. So she had a client that sent her to Vegas for something for the weekend. And I was like, I'm coming because I had a, I had a photo shoot with uh with, with our with my friend Joel and so we stayed in her place and then um I got uh I my friend Sheena was doing the um the show at the Paris the was oh sex type sex tips from gay men that straight women should know <laughs> anyway, she, she know was starring in this it's a very <laughs> funny show and the guy that is like the gay guy giving us up that his name's chester and he's hilarious um oh but we goodness. went and did that show at the paris and that was really really fun and then um i knew a promoter from hyde who worked at hyde then back when i knew him he didn't work at hyde Promoters. and i was at the hermes store in the Bellagio at like midnight smelling perfume and squeezing Birkins and he's like Rachel come to hide and I'm like you got the champagne he's like of course I have champagne for you what do you think this is the dark ages like great so then her and I ended up doing that and then I had my photo shoot and I think we went to the pool and like that was that but we did it all for free so I actually over the last year I actually had my Vegas moment um I uh, met a, a friend at Burning Man and we've been going to Vegas together. Um, she's a high-end gambler and we would get everything comped and we're talking like the, the, the expensive tables and like park, MGM park, oh, yeah. not, not the other place. Oh my not God. That, not that, not that grand. Nonsense. No, that's yeah. MGM oh, totally. grand crap where they, last Ooh. time I was there, literally someone pooped in the main thing and they were cleaning yeah. it up. Yeah, the riffraff. Yeah. The riff rap. Yeah, but, that's, uh, I mean, that's the secret to Vegas. If you can dedicate four hours of yeah. play per day to the casino floor, they will give you the earth, sun, moon. Our entire, of all of it. every trip was comped and every food, we would just eat in the diamond room and things yeah. like that. So that was pretty yeah. nice. Hopefully that'll happen again. Um, I uh, Crunch is in Vegas. Did you know that? Our, our friend. I did not. I talked to him not all that long ago, probably like a year ago, but I didn't know he was in Vegas. So that's a good spot for him, though. I'm going to get him on here um, on, a, on a podcast. I was actually, he called me yesterday. I've been helping him with his ability is to okay? use GarageBand. Oh, he's hilarious. Like, I mean, he had COVID, but he had gone shooting guns or something in the desert with his friends and they were driving around and they hit a pothole and it messed up his back. So the next thing you know, he's in the hospital with his back. And I don't know, like. I don't know how he likes having his surgery. <laughs> he's, 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 he went to Burning Man last year. Like, he actually does crazy shit. He's but, such uh, an incredible human being. We're so lucky to, like, live in an era at the same time as it's, John Drake. I'll have to do a Zoom call with you and him just to catch up sometime. But he's, oh, my Lord, he's hilarious. Uh, I took him to see Ready Player One. Uh, the movie in Vegas that's the video game-ish movie but there's a book and in the book there's these three keys that they basically the world of Ready Player One is like a, it's like a unity world where they built like an Unreal Engine world where there's a whole gaming world and the guy who made it is dying or is going to die and when he dies he wants to leave it to a gamer not to the corporations so he has like this challenges set up right so if you can get the three keys 
you win the whole thing. In the original book, one of the three keys is the Captain Crunch whistle. Stop. It's like a horcrux. Oh my God. So I took John to see the, the movie in Vegas of Ready Player One, where now they have like DeLoreans are flying around. It's all like video game stuff. It's really, really cool. Uh, there's no mention of the, the Captain Crunch whistle, but I took him to see the movie. That was pretty cool. You know, that was a gross misstep on their part. But yeah, that's a, that's a good place for him. He's such an incredible person. He was really Well, um, you know, I remember you were very nice to him when you would make Thanksgiving dinner for him and things like that. I think that was really yeah, sweet. Yeah, we did Thanksgiving for him, Christmas. I would always make him snacks at the office too at Intigo, and he would hate it all of them. Santa all Crunch? Them. Every single snack I made. Yeah, he hated them. He would, he would come... He would be like, what is this? No, he can't can't eat. His teeth are fucked, right? I mean, he's he's okay, but I'm just saying he has a hard time eating some things. But uh uh he's hated every snack I make. Every Thanksgiving and every Christmas dinner, totally into it. Snacks, absolutely not. I got an F and snack. I have uh I have a Captain Crunch whistle. I'm gonna get him on the podcast here in a in a few days. That should be interesting. And so by the way, these are coming out every Wednesday. Uh, today we're going to post one that I did with Moses Avalon. He's a friend of mine in, uh, in LA. And then we'll post this one on next Wednesday. Tomorrow I'm interviewing Chris Brogan, marketer. He's awesome. He's someone who does keynotes. And then I have Steve Thompson who produced a uh, mixed corn, seven Grammys. He did Guns N' Roses and Metallica mixed appetite for destruction and, uh, Metallica's injustice for all the two records I grew up with. So I'm, I'm interviewing him on Friday. He's a friend of mine and we've done some pretty cool stuff together. We can talk about um so a lot of neat things coming along the pipeline um really cool to have you on here um well why don't we end why don't we wrap up this i'll hit i'll stop the recording and then we can just catch up on anything else um so anything you want to mention that you have coming up before we end um or pl- plug away have, plug away <laughs> i don't necessarily have anything coming up but i will say this i do make a lot of music videos that are like artist breaky sort of music videos I did one last year for Hannibal Luna with the ACLU that like blew all the way up. Um, and then I did this other one for Rita Rumprose and we got great traction for her. We got her on Pluto TV. We got her on Reverie um, and it was her first video. So any advice for artists? Yeah. Uh, if you are in the neighborhood for a music video that you need to break yourself with or you know you need to jump from to to one teetery mario level to the other let me know and we'll see if we can get something together all right i think i know someone who might call you <laughs> see i'm pretty funny you know i actually did one stand up at flappers at burbank at flappers it's on my facebook scroll back and type flappers and you'll see it um i'd love your opinion uh i was gonna do I, my whole plan was to do one at flappers and then maybe do one at like uh the the improv and then just pretend to be a comedian but never do any other shows and just use that in my demo to, like <laughs> to try to get gigs as an actor like, but I'm, I'm not an actor it. well you know i mean the thing is it's like stand up a lot of people aren't actually stand-up comedians. They use stand-up as a vehicle to get auditions because you some like for whatever reason you like prove you're funny in Hollywood. So if you're not gonna do like Second City or Groundlings or any of that stuff, like people are like, oh they stand up. And you know, if you want to play the Canoga Park bowling alley, do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll there's teach, also it'll teach you how to be on stage for sure. Well, like you said, Groundlings and the other one, but there's another one um, in, uh, what's, I forget, in Franklin Village. What's it called? UCB? Yeah. It used to be. Upright Citizens Upright Brigade. Citizens. Can't not mention that if you're going to mention that. Um, that's pretty cool. Fine. All right. Fine. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I look forward to seeing more of your um, your No Filter Fridays and the movies you're filming and everything that's coming out. I'll be sure to share it when it comes out. And uh, with that, thanks very much. Have a wonderful rest of your totally. trip. And I will end it at there. Thank you. You too.